Hello, and welcome to the Books Uncovered podcast, a podcast brought to you by Fulcrum Publishing, where we explore the world of books and the people who make up the publishing and the book and reading industry. I am Sam Shinta, publisher of Fulcrum Publishing, and I'm joined by my co-host, Kateri Kramer, Fulcrum's marketing director. Hi, Kateri. How are you today? I'm doing well. I'm um, adjusting to being back after vacation, but it's nice to be home. Although and you were hillier. <laughs> you were in Mexico, correct? Yeah, I was in Oaxaca for about a Oaxaca. week. Oaxaca. Excellent. Yeah. Do you have a nice time? Yeah, it was great. The best food I've ever eaten. Like wow. hands down. Have yeah. you been there before? Um, not to that part of the country, no, but um I would go back in a heartbeat. Oh, I would nice. move there actually, probably. Yeah. Well, there we go. We need the fulcrum Oaxaca yeah. office. <laughs> yeah. <Would> be... <laughs> <laughs> Could totally Absolutely. do it. Good. Good. How are yeah. you? Uh, you know, it's uh, it's it's approaching mid March, and we're supposed to get a big snowstorm. So that's stupid. Par uh, for but, the course. You know, yeah, par for the course. It's like we we have no snow for like most of the winter, and now the past couple of weeks we're just getting boatloads of snow. So, yeah. uh, but hopefully this one will be not as bad. Although looking out the window right now, it's falling a little bit faster. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll we'll have to see. It's at least it's pretty, right? So yeah, it's it, it could sure. be worse. Exactly. Well, we've got a terrific guest today, uh, as always, and and many, many thanks. Uh, I know she co-hosted the last time because I was unavailable, but Kelly uh, just does such a wonderful job of lining people up and finding these wonderful, interesting people to talk with, uh, and and today is no exception. Uh, Hattie Par Parmetter is the founder of Woe Mag. Whoa, Mag, all caps, the Women of Heart and Outdoor Adventure magazine, which features amazing women and their relationships with the outdoors. She loves encouraging people to get outdoors, especially in the Midwest, reading literary journalism, gardening, and paddling. Welcome, Hattie. How are you doing today? Hey, guys. I'm doing well. How are you? We're doing great. And so you are just up the road from us over in Black River Falls. Uh, if, is that correct? Yeah, we moved here um, about a year and a half ago, spent uh, about a decade in Chicago, my partner Kevin and I, and we decided we wanted to get out in the woods and um, the yurt brought us to the woods. So now we have some some acreage and some outside time all the time and we love it. <laughs> so, so you mentioned the yurt. So you are in the yurt right now and you live in a yurt. I do. I live in a yurt. Wow. So how... Tell us about that, because that is that is a very interesting choice. <clears throat> well, um, when you when you freelance write, banks don't care about your invoices and your history as a freelancer. They just don't trust you no matter what. So getting a mortgage or getting any, any kind of loan is really difficult. So the year it was a way for us to leave the city and still be able to purchase property and have a home. So we built the structure. Um, everything that you can see that's part of the structure here um, is a part of a kit, actually. Um, Great Lakes Yurt Co. out of Michigan has kits and you can purchase them through them and they have instructions and all the materials that you need. So we had no construction experience at all, <laughs> literally nothing. And we uh, put some SOSs out on social media saying, hey, we need people because some of the materials are very, very heavy. Mm -hmm. Um, and a bunch of people just came up and helped us. And it was a, a group effort. I think there were probably 10 or 12 people involved throughout the process. You know, two people would come for a couple of days and then they'd leave. And then it was just an ongoing, uh, madhouse for about maybe five, five, six days. And yeah. so is that, is that a skylight there that I see right over your head? So you have a nice skylight built in. Yeah, it's um it's three feet wide. We call it the dome and it's made out of fiberglass and it's okay. um it like caps off the whole structure, makes it waterproof. It's kind of cool. You can sort of see the way the sun is coming down right now. It's kind of like a sundial. So at certain parts of the day, I cannot sit at this desk because it's beaming directly on me and it's like just being on fire. <laughs> um yeah, it's interesting. It's cool. It's a fun way to kind of see the seasons change when you see the way that the light has changed as it moves around the building. And you know, Black River Falls isn't uh, you know, being in, in upper Wisconsin is not known for its warmth. Uh do you have then a little heater in there? Is it a, a like a wood stove? And does yeah, that, keep, does that keep you warm? Stove. 
Yeah, we have a pretty big wood stove. Uh, I actually, before this call, was hustling out to the wood pile with my sled to fill it up with wood and bring it in as fast as we could. So it's, uh, there are definitely times when it's gotten pretty cold when we hit the like negative 20s. Uh, definitely everyone's cold all the time when it's like that. So it's not special to the yurt, I would say. Uh, but yeah, it, it can get a little chilly and hot in the summertime too. It's a pretty unique structure, but we have AC. So oh wow, it work. Yeah. Oh, wow. That is so. Um, and, and, you know, the, so the yurts come from Mongolia originally. Uh, and so it's, it would seem to make sense that, you know, those are going to be pretty weather resistant, but wow, that's yeah. a, and so how many uh, acres do you have up there then? We've got 20 and we're, we're so thrilled. That's like part used to be managed forestry land. So there's like a bunch of pines in the back and then there's a um, supposedly self-sustaining trout stream which um, I've yet to see a fish in it, but I'm definitely working. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> and, and before before we jump down the call, you were mentioning that you also have chickens who live under the yurt. Yeah, we have a nice coop for them, but the yurt is 30 feet wide and it's like a great place for them to hang out and not worry about anything coming at them from the sky and they can see really well. And it's like pretty... Uh, protected from breezes and rain so they're often under there which means at some point during this call you will be hearing a rooster screaming <laughs> <laughs> good good warning good to know yeah <clears throat> so have you have you uh enjoyed the adjustment away from the big city to uh i mean just talk about you here you are in one of the biggest cities in the country and now moving to this remote place and living in a yurt how has that been I grew up actually in northern Minnesota and there were more people in my college dorm in Chicago than there were in my hometown. So um, it's it's totally fine for us to kind of go right back to that sort of mentality and that level of community. It's in a big city, it's very easy to not even know your neighbors. Um, mm -hmm. But as a dog owner, I, we knew everybody in our building because we always had the pups out and we're constantly interacting with people and everyone wants to, you know, visit with the pups. And so it's nice to have a sense of community um, that's just a little bit closer, I would say, than Chicago because there's so many fewer people. How has like moving out of the city, if at all, changed your like writing habits? People are constantly, constantly telling me to write about the year. It's like a never ending barrage. Yeah. I haven't. I've never written about the yurt. <laughs> uh, we have a social media account, but I've never like sat down and actually written anything. I just, it's just kind of my life. It's not something like, I'm yeah. like, what do you want to know? What should I be writing about the yurt? And people are like, just talk about your chickens and you know, the weather. And I'm like, okay. So I don't know. I haven't, I haven't done the writing about the yurt. Maybe it's time. <laughs> do you find that you're writing more now that you're away from a city, whether it's like regardless of what it's about, or does that feel like, because I know some people like they, they thrive off of that city energy and then other people have to get away to kind of get into writing. Totally. I, I actually went to a, I'm, I do a lot of yoga and I'm a yoga teacher and I went to a yoga retreat last weekend in Northern Minnesota. And it was weird because previously if I went to a retreat I would be retreating from the city that was the whole point and now I'm like oh I live in a place where you could do a retreat so yeah. I totally I know what you mean I, I've always been writing in the outdoor industry and so it's nice to be physically mm -hmm. able to like I could test a product out my front door if I wanted to or I could like quick go on a hike and it's not a big deal it is nice to be like living closer to those values that I do try to hold dear in my writing and have that subject matter in my writing yeah yeah. Can you give us, I like jumped right in, but can you give us a little bit of background about your like writing history and what you're doing now? Yeah. Um, I went to Columbia College Chicago in downtown Chicago and got a degree in magazine journalism. And as a kid, I wanted to be the editor in chief of Teen Vogue, which don't we all? <laughs> um, it's changed a heck of a lot. I think it's a lot cooler of a publication now than it was when I was, you know, 12. Um, but I, over the years I was, I wrote for like a marketing agency, did a lot of, um, behind the scenes stuff that's not under my name. And then finally transitioned to freelancing. And I've done some work for, um, REI, Triple A via, um, the dirt hip camp, and then finally started editing for the outbound collective, um, which is an app that helps people get outside with GPX tracks for different trails and is all about inclusivity and accessibility in the outdoors. So my job as the editor there is to um, facilitate 
partnerships and write all kinds of things that help people, anybody get outside from your next door neighbor who's in their 60s and has never really hiked to a really avid like mountaineer. So it's been a winding path to get here, but I'm very stoked about where I am now. <laughs> and it's a super cool publication app, whatever you want to call it. It's great. It's all um, of the above. <laughs> yes, it's very helpful. What, um, I mean, you mentioned this whole idea of, of getting people outdoors. Um, what do you, uh, I'm trying to figure out the best way to frame this. What do you find are the biggest obstacles people have to maybe getting outdoors and enjoying the, the natural world? Um, community is a huge one. So people who have grown up and didn't have like parental figures or the community to go outside with them, people, who, nobody was encouraging to go outside. It wasn't even like a thought. Um, or, you know, like I worked for REI in Chicago as a salesperson and as a guide for quite a while. And the people who had come to my classes, I taught everything from stand-up paddleboarding to yoga to, I had a Valentine's day class called wooing in the woods about, um, setting up a campsite that would be like comfortable for your partner if they're not into the outdoors so much. Um, and the people who would come to those classes would constantly say, I just don't have anyone to do this stuff with. I don't, you know, I don't want to do it by myself. I'm not comfortable being alone on the trail, or I don't feel like I have enough knowledge about, you know, hiking or paddling to go figure it out myself. So community is definitely a huge barrier. And then cost, of course. Um, I think it's very easy to look at something like the outdoors and the outdoor rec and think, man, I could never afford a pair of downhill skis, or I could never afford, you know, a pair of hiking boots. And there are so many products out there that are not like meant for the outdoors that are not marketed as something that you should wear for an outdoor activity that could absolutely fit the bill and whatever you own, there's probably something you already have that could at least provide your apparel and your footwear, and then you could rent something somewhere. So there's there's always that option. Obviously, there's a lot of places where there's not, there's a lack of public transportation, which is also a huge problem. Um, there's, there's there's so many places that need more, more green space immediately close to them that that's definitely, Chicago is kind of a great place in terms of, it has the largest forest preserve system in the country. So if you, you know, hop on the right train or take the right bus, you can get to acres and acres of beautiful green space, but it is still within, you know, visuals of downtown skyscrapers, or there's a train next door, or there's some kind of like noise pollution. A lot, a lot of barriers for sure. And have you found with uh, the work you've done that that's helped to break down some of these barriers? I mean, have you heard from some of the readers about this idea that, well, I always thought it was going to be, you know, something I couldn't do. And now I, I can't, I've, I've kind of built it into my life. I would, I would really love to say that I have heard definitively that I have been helpful. Um, I, I do hear, so WOMEG um, is based it's specifically for women, women with an X instead of an E. So whoever kind of fits himself into that spectrum. Um, WOMEG has definitely, I've gotten some really cool feedback there of just women specifically. One of the main things I've heard in person is um, I don't want my partner to teach me this thing because I don't want that like to be a part of that relationship. Or what if that partnership breaks up? And then I can't do that thing anymore. Or I, you know, my relationship with that thing changes. So it's definitely, it's nice to have some of these more inclusive and specific spaces where um, there are a little bit of specifics that make things more inclusive. Um, and Woe has been a fun way to do that. I don't do a ton of events in person. I actually loathe planning events with my entire being. It makes me like want to scream and throw my computer, <laughs> but I always end up doing it anyway. Um, and the few events that I have hosted or been a part of have been really great because that's one of the rare times when you do get to interact with people in person and kind of hear those, those stories or, um, you know, catch a, something from a passing conversation about how stoked someone is to be there. <laughs> and when, when did you start Woe? Um, I think it was like 2015. Oh, wow. Hiatus. Okay. I think that's true. Yeah. I took a little, I took like a two year hiatus, which happened to coincide with pandemic, um, because I didn't have the time I was trying to work on my career instead of putting my energy into woe. And I recently resurrected it. Today is actually going to be the first article back after the hiatus. So I'm posting a really cool story about a woman who was, um, sex trafficked as a teenager and found healing through backpacking and through oh, the wow. outdoors. So it was a really, really neat story that was shared with me. And I'm very excited to post that today and get that out to the world. That's awesome. 
what what motivated you to to start Whoa? Um, being in Chicago at the time and not having an outdoor community yet, I had not um worked for REI. I hadn't I was also a kayaking guide in Chicago on the river, so I hadn't met that crew yet and I hadn't I didn't have that outdoor community. I was like super sad going from northern Minnesota to the concrete jungle and feeling like I didn't know how I could get outside and still live where I lived and have those opportunities and the resources of the the urban area. So I was Googling like crazy and trying to find a women's specific publication or women's specific resource. And there just wasn't any. And shortly I learned about um, She Explores and Gail Straub, the creator of that publication and that organization and kind of just started posting. And my Midwest location has been really kind of integral for it because when you think about the outdoors, I feel like most people think of like sweeping vistas and stunning mountain peaks and the ocean. And we have none of those, but we're still awesome. <laughs> well, we got, so. we've got rivers and bluffs, you know, that's pretty yeah, darn good. Too, exactly. So. It's we we're the whole flyover thing is just garbage. I hate it so much. <laughs> Plus we have the best trout streams in the world. Hey, there you go. So, I will be learning. Region, so. <laughs> I am so excited this summer. I'm going to a fly fishing camp in the Driftless, and that's my first time fly fishing. So I'm super stoked to get out there and give that a try. <laughs> See, I, I just keep saying this to make Kateri jealous because I, I know, know I she just jealous. loves fishing, and you know, oh. it's like she she can come and visit us, but you yeah. know. I know. <laughs> come on I, know. Out. <laughs> I really need to. I mean, I think that. It's, it's interesting because at least here in Colorado, there's there's definitely like a, a vibe as like a female who goes fishing. Either like I go out with my sister um, most of the time and it's just the two of us. Um, and I can't tell you how many times I've gotten like just completely unsolicited advice from people walking by. It was Ugh. like, I knew that. Thank you. Didn't need your help. Um, And it's just interesting to see how that community is changing so much. Um, But it's not one that I feel like is changing as quickly as like some of the other outdoor communities, which is, I don't know. It's, it's, it's interesting because I, I, in some ways, fly fishing's accessibility um, is more accessible and in other ways, like financially, it's less accessible. Um, a person who has chronic illness or chronic pain or is not able to hike a lot, like they can go fishing and enjoy the outdoors, but then you're like dropping hundreds of dollars on this like crazy expensive gear that there aren't lots of options for. Um, I'm just now learning that Wisconsin is especially great for accessible fishing because mm -hmm. the water, Mm -hmm. you don't need waders. Like as, oh, depending on the time of year, you could put on your chacos and walk into the stream and okay. find some great fish. So that's something that I just learned actually in the last week. There's a um, an organization. I don't remember if the organization is called this or if it's just an event, but it's called the Outcast Campout. And they have a couple mm-hmm. across the country, like Maine and Montana and Wisconsin. This is the first one. They're, um, they're super, super into inclusivity as far as um, sexual preferences, genders, and then also mobility levels. So there's mm-hmm. a lot of attendees who have varying levels of mobility needs, whether it's a wheelchair or another adaptive um, device. And they're they're coming to Wisconsin, and I'm like thrilled out of my mind because it is very much a like white cis het guy space. Mm-hmm. And I yeah. I'm I don't have a problem with learning from someone that you know is in that that genre of people. That's not a thing, you know what I mean. <laughs> Um, but it's it, I'm very excited to learn alongside people who have no idea like me yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's no, intimidating right. well and in <laughs> terms of accessibility we've got some places like uh in Sparta which is a town not far from here and I close not far from Black River either uh the La Crosse River runs through a park downtown and you'll see people fly fishing just right there in the park uh, oh. or in, uh, down in, uh, um, Cashton or, uh, um, uh, Coon Valley down here, you've got some rivers. And again, they just run right through the middle of town and people will just go walk up and fish right there in town. So highly oh. it's like paved sidewalk, right. That you can just get right in and, and you're absolutely right. You don't need waders. I mean, they, in some rivers it would, it helps a little bit, but you, have, you can just do hip waders. Even you don't need the right. full chest waders and all that. So yeah, a lot of good alternatives. 
Yeah, we can really only. I know there's a spot in a little bit. Really? Why? Yeah, Jul- like July through S- September usually, but it might not even be July this year because we've gotten so much snow that the runoff is going to be really high. Yeah. Um, and everything's coming from the Alpine for the most part. So it's just, it, it gets pretty cold. Um, but that being said, like a lot of people will just like wet weight and they'll wear like neoprene socks or something like that. Um, yeah. But like our accessibility in terms of something that's you can pull up off the road, there it's there. You you have it, but it's going to be crowded. So you're not going to have that like solitary experience totally. um, where you're having to like hike in somewhere or backpack in even um, that kind of thing or Knowledge. your paper water. Right. Knowledge is another one of the huge barriers to the outdoors, whatever oh, yeah. it is. Cause it's like, you, there might be an incredible trail near you that you've never heard of. And you maybe will never hear of like, you know, seeking it out. And it's, it's tricky. There's a lot of talk about like geotagging right now mm-hmm. and whether it's okay to share where your location is, whether it's like actually geotagging it on like a social media post so people can find the um, coordinates and whether that's okay. So there's a lot of like gatekeeping and if you do share something people make it angry or you know why are you sharing this when we don't want the resources to be trampled or it's such a fine line to figure out how do you provide that accessibility aspect and give people that knowledge but also not like flood these places these smaller spots and these more secret areas with other people and additional you know traffic it's a very fine line Who do you feel like, um, I mean, I, we've talked about women a little bit, um, but who else do you feel like that we might not originally think of is like underrepresented in the outdoor industry? Like you've seen it from editor, writer, outdoorist, all of these different perspectives. Who, who do we need to hear more from? Indigenous voices, always. Um, the album has a writer's residency for underrepresented storytellers and we don't know what it's going to look like this year. We're kind of working on it. It might not be an entirely written artist component. We might break into some graphic stuff. So info to come on that. But in the past, we've had um, several people who are members of indigenous communities, whether it's um, uh, Native American or even um, people who indi- who uh, are originally from like Mexico or southern more southern regions. And it's been really great to have just completely different perspectives and it's I think it's really helpful to have very open dialogue so there are definitely times where I've edited a piece and then a writer has come back and said hey like let's talk about why I use these terms and why I want to continue using these terms or this is something specific to a culture that I don't understand so as an editor and even as a reader it's super important to just be totally open to learning different perspectives and we, the album is constantly elevating voices that are underrepresented in the outdoor recreation space as consumer and as um, like people in the industry. So it's, it's really cool. I love, I've ha- Kateri has sent me several wonderful books from Fulcrum that have been really great reads. And I think y'all are killing it with, with, you know, especially indigenous voices and representing some people that, you know, are, are not, the info is not out there yet. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's been a, a definite passion of what we do. I mean, we 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 started as a publisher about the land uh, almost forty years ago. That was a big thing for us, and this whole idea of stewardship has you know run through a lot of what we've done over the years. Uh, and and again, trying to to include a lot of different voices. So the indigenous voice is obviously very important, but we also have uh, you know we we've done two books, two of my favorite books by a woman rancher. Right. And so this is one of those uh, audio that one of these uh, types of writers that people don't think of as like people who are interested in conservation and stewardship. And yet who is closer to the land than somebody who ranches the land in Montana. Absolutely. Uh, and yeah. uh, so we've tried to make sure that the representation is diverse across a variety of, of places to try and just make sure that people understand that like this whole idea of the land, it, it touches all of us. You know, we, we, and, and, and this is what I love about what you're doing is you're now bringing that down to that real granular level of, yeah, it is for all of us. And I'm going to help you, even if it seems intimidating to make sure that you can get out there and enjoy it in some way that there will, will come up with the, your level 
and make sure that based on your level, you will be able to actually celebrate the same thing that, you know, someone who's climbing a 14 er gets to celebrate, but in your own, in your own way. Absolutely. I love yeah. it. I, I think that we, we need more of you out there to do this because uh, I, I think we probably can all agree, you know, when you're, when you spend time outdoors uh, in nature, it's like your soul is just nourished and, and the, you know, in, in our crazy world today uh, in so many ways, the, the ability to find that nourishment is just so essential for so oh, many absolutely. people. Yeah. I'm curious if you could share like one of your most formative outdoor experiences that you've had that like made you want to do this. I know that's like a weird, I, no I don't one has asked about that me for that. myself. Ooh. Oh. I'm usually the one interviewing people. So this is kind of a treat to be the one on the other end of things. <laughs> um, I I don't know that I could point out like one specific thing because my I'm very lucky to have grown up in Northern Minnesota where we were outside all the time. Like my, I would wake up and my parents would say goodbye and we would go outside and we would come back when we were hungry um, or like to switch bathing suits because the one we had was too muddy or something. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm absolutely very lucky in that way. And I want to like acknowledge my privilege and in, in the way that I grew up. Um, I started going to a YMCA camp out of Ely, Minnesota, which is at the very tippy top um, when I was probably like 13 um, it's called Camp Wedgie Wagon, and it is a canoeing and backpacking camp that takes kids out on trips from like three to four days is the the introductory. And then each year you bump up to the very end when you're 17 or 18 is a like 50 day Arctic trip. And the big one is um, pack, pack canoeing. Um, you fly in on like a a little plane with all your stuff in it and they drop you off and you have a button to push in case a bear is bothering you and it's an emergency. Um, I did not do that trip, but I did the level right below that, which was I think like 32 days in Canada. Um, and I went back to that camp every year from 13 until about 17. And now I'm on the board of advisors, which oh, cool. it's been really neat to like completely turn around my role at the camp from being the camper and the little kid who like, I grew up on a lake and with an outdoorsy family, but I didn't have access to like some of the, the canoes and like the terminology. I showed up to camp with one of those Coleman sleeping bags. That's flannel. And it's like this big when you roll it up. And I thought my camper was going to like throw me out. <laughs> my counselor, she was kind of like, Oh my God, you're going to take up the whole bag just with this, the sleeping bag. <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't know there were technical sleeping bags. I didn't know that was a thing that I should, you know, be looking into. And my parents obviously had no idea. So I love being on the board of advisors. I'm on the um, social responsibility and alumni communication board. So I write the newsletter with the camp director and that goes out to, I don't know how many people, but a ton of people who are involved with the camp and who financially support the YMCA of the North, which is based out of um, St. Paul. Mm -hmm. So it's been, that has been a formative experience in terms of continuing my relationship with the camp and with the outdoors in that way. That's where I learned to paddle and my love for wood canvas canoes, which weigh like 100, 110 pounds when wet, um, which is a form of torture. <laughs> but it's worth it. <laughs> That's super cool. <laughs> Did what you about you? What's your formative experience with the outdoors? Could you pick one? That's I mean, a tough one. As I was asking you, I was like, oh God, I hope she doesn't ask me this because I don't know what the answer you is. You can pass. It's um, okay. <laughs> no, I mean, I think it was probably like camping with my dad as I grew up. Um, it was either that or he used to be the caretaker of like a alpine fishing ranch. Um, yeah, in the Arapaho National Forest. And he took my sister and I up once and he like, there was no trail, but he like took us through the woods to this like natural spring. And we like filled up our water bottles and we were like, how did he remember it's here? And I just remember it being really cool. And like, I don't know him telling us all of these stories of him when he was like 20 alone, getting this like ranch area set up for all of these people who are going to come and stay there over the summer and just being like, wow, my dad's really cool. But also like, I want to do this kind of stuff. So that it was Aww. probably that or like camping when I was even younger with him. Is he alive? Is he He's not. You, ugh, I was going to say, you got to tell him about this. This is so special. 
I hope I he know, knows right? that you had such a wonderful time. That's awesome. I think he did because we went back a number of times. Um, but yeah, it's just like, I think I forget when I'm in the mountains that like growing up with somebody who could teach me that was, it was a huge privilege. And yeah. a lot of my friends did not have that. Totally. What yeah. about you, Sam? It sounds like you have some outdoor interests as well. Do you have a formative experience? Um, I, I'm, I'm going to kind of flip it to the other side. So um, I we did not do a lot of this growing up. So I had to find it my own. Uh, so when we had my daughter, uh, it was incumbent on me to make sure she spent a lot of time outdoors. Mm-hmm. Um, her first day of walking, we actually had her on a trail in Colorado. Uh, like she was in her, she was in a backpack, one of those, you know, backpacks, but she had learned to walk a couple of days before, but she just won't stay in the backpack. So it's like, okay, fine. You know, you're now on the trail and she just took to it. Um, but she and I had many, many camping trips. My wife was, uh, in nursing school for a few years. And so we were just able to go on these wonderful camping trips. And I, I remember one, two, Canyonlands, which was just absolutely spectacular. Uh, we went a little bit off season. I want to say maybe April. So it was before the crowds and the throngs get there. Perfect. And just, I think she was maybe six and, and it was a pretty long hike up to the top of a Mesa, but she stuck in. And when we got to the top, it was just this awe, just looking at the awe in her face of, wow, look at everything I can see from here. Uh, and since then she is, she's summited several 14ers and she is just like, got this in her blood. She's a skier and she just, you know, she always wants to be uh, out of doors anytime she can. So, yeah, I, I, I see that, that again, that privilege of being able to spend time with somebody and, and be able to, to show them the thing that you love so much, uh, and pass that on. And then, and then just being able to, to relish in the joy of watching them then, now develop that love on their own and to do things that I don't, I, I, I think I've climbed one 14 and, you know, for her, it's like a big, big deal. Every time she's back <laughs> in Colorado, she's like, got a summit, got a summit. <laughs> I hear it's kind of like a bug. <laughs> yeah. It, it really, it, it kind of gets in your blood and she just, um, you know, she's, uh, she did a, a couple of Y camps and she did one out in Colorado uh, and I want to say maybe she was 15, but she's got this great picture of her doing a yoga pose on the top of Long's Peak. And it's just one of my favorite picks too. It's just, again, all those things that kind of celebrate everything about being outdoors and, and just being able to enjoy that. Absolutely. You guys are making me cry a little bit. <laughs> my eyeballs. <Oy. laughs> hmm. Well, I just love the fact that you are making that happen for other people. That is just so terrific in in both your the magazine that you found and then with this uh, outbound collective that you are you're telling stories that haven't been told. You're showing people through those stories that it is possible. You are making sure to, you know, get over I, I, your story about the Coleman uh, camping or the Coleman sleeping bag is just great because, again, you tell someone, hey, you know, bring a sleeping bag. That's what most people do. Most people don't know about the REI of the world, right? This whole idea that there's all this different gear uh, and and cost might be an obstacle. But the fact that you're getting that uh, word out there is just wonderful. So we so appreciate you doing this. And the fact that you're doing it here in Wisconsin is, is, is wonderful as well. Thank you. For the record, I do love Coleman. They have great stuff. Just want to make sure I fit for the opportunity. <laughs> yeah, just uh, they're great sleeping bags for car camping, right? Exactly. But, but not Absolutely. for backpacking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> not that model anyway. <laughs> yeah, I, I, know, I know exactly the flannel one you're talking about. I think we've yep. got one of those kicking around here still. <laughs> they're the great sleepover bags. Um, yes, totally. So, uh, well, this is this is just uh, wonderful. And I think we could probably talk all day about outdoor stories and outdoor inspiration. But let's maybe talk about some inspiring reads uh, and talk about books that we really love by women about uh, outdoors, the outdoors and nature. And so, Hattie, we always start with our guests. Um, so this was a tough one. When I when I was asked to make a list, I was like, you better stop me. <laughs> uh, um I really enjoy literary journalism, which is a term that I only recently learned about, and I'm so glad I did. It's essentially, if you like like long form magazine articles, it's it's essentially a book that's a long form magazine article. So there's 
um, some level of science, some level of like statistics and data, but there's also some personal aspects. And um, one that I read really recently that I loved is Fuzz by Mary Roach. And Mary Roach is a great example of literary journalism. She does a crap ton of reporting, like a year's worth of reporting for every book. This particular one is talking about wildlife and human interactions. And it's great stories from like how maybe mountain towns or ski towns, how their restaurants um, handle their waste to try to not entice bears and like what is a nuisance bear and how does that work and how do how do people try to deter bears from becoming habituated and bears aren't the only animal but the whole the whole piece has got some really wild crazy stories about animal interactions with people and sometimes it's hilarious sometimes it's sad it's definitely a more memorable book in my recent reading history <laughs> what it about sounds you really good definitely worth a read <laughs> yeah she is she the one who wrote the book um about being a coroner is that uh a yeah stiff Stiff. Okay. Stiff, yep. 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 Yeah. Her right. He, she is terrific. <laughs> she, and yeah. she writes about such eclectic stuff. stuff. Oh, golly. You need to. They're, yeah. They're hilarious at times. I too. enjoy the audio books too, because she oh, reads them. Sure. And so oh, that's wow. like an extra. I've just gotten into audio books because I'm like, need to be doing something all the time. I should really like stop doing that. But it's, it's nice to have something to listen to, especially when it's by yeah. the author. That's like extra special. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so my next one, I would say um, there's a really great author named Emma Walker, and she wrote a book called Dead Reckoning, Learning from Accidents in the Outdoors. Mm. Um, she also did a piece of literary journalism. It's a, a little bit thinner than Fuzz, um, and it's all about like different incidents that have happened in the outdoors with injury or fatality mm. and what has been learned from them and then how like emergency medicine can kind of change to handle these different situations. So anything from oh, like cool. avalanche to like falls or like freak accidents with climbing. Um, it's definitely not for the faint of heart. If you have like issues with gore, um, definitely not for you just because there, there is some definite physical trauma, but just really interesting. I've done a woofer, um, a woofa wilderness first aid course and um, found it really, really interesting. So being able to read about that was really neat. That's cool. Yeah. I'm always like slightly hesitant because I've, the American Alpine Club also puts out like an accident report. I don't know if it's every year anymore. It used to be, um, but it's like, it's just a short book basically. And it's like, I guess it might even be considered literary journalism, um, yeah. but. She uses it in part of the book for sure. Yeah. And it's, it's cool. However, there are a couple in there where I was like, who I am never going to be on this mountain. <laughs> like I read it and I was like, never going to go there ever again. Yeah. Um, it's where scary. it just like sticks with you. And it's like, whether it's like a danger factor and there was just an accident or like some suspicious activity happened and they like never found a body like that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I'm like really interested in it, but I'm also always just like a little bit nervous that it's going to like shrink my, what I'm like able or willing to do in the outdoors. Totally. Um, I probably need to get over that, but still. I think that's healthy. That's probably yeah. really healthy. <laughs> Having some healthy respect for what can and does happen. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, what about you, Kateri? Um, I chose... I Sam and I talked about this a little bit and then I didn't choose the two books that we oh. talked about because I looked at my bookshelf and I was like, oh my God, I forgot about these. <laughs> um, so the first one I chose is Gathering Moss by Robin Wall Kimmerer, which most people know um, Braiding Sweetgrass, which is maybe one of the more famous like outdoor ecology books. But I love this book because it is literally about moss um, and it's about her kind of weaving her experiences in the outdoors and seeing moss but then like the science behind it and why it's important to ecosystems and the like slow quiet growth that go goes along with it and then it has that more like indigenous perspective as well um and it's just really really well done and well written and makes you think about things in a different way, which is really nice. Um, and then the other one I did is H is for Hawk by Helen McDonald. 
um, which is one of my favorite books of all time. Um, I love birds. I love raptors and the relationship between the author and then this goshawk that she kind of adopts and um, cares for is just really incredible. And I like the, the, it being very like small, it's not about her like summiting big mountains or doing crazy stuff in the outdoors, but it's like, she loses her father. She's really depressed. She adopts this hawk that should probably not it's, it's like one of the more difficult types of hawks to train. Um, and like how she starts taking on his sensibility. Actually, I think it's a her, it's Mabel, her sensibilities and like the things that she's doing and how it relates to her grief. It's, it's a really, really good book. I think I started reading that because you recommended it. Really? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. A couple months ago, you mentioned that. Oh, nice. Yeah. It's so good. And her other book, Best for Flights is also really good. It's just not all about one animal. She kind of moves around. What about you, Sam? Well, unfortunately, my my favorite book of all, one of my favorite books of all time, I already picked for the Christmas episode, Nan Shepard's The Living Mountain, which I just think is just such a terrific uh, book about how small spaces can. <laughs> so, so I had to go pick others, and and I Kateri, I'm I'm glad you picked Age for Hawk because I almost picked that one. Uh, oh but my then, gosh! <laughs> um, so uh, I I picked um, one uh, that yeah, I I love that you're talking about literary journalism. This book from a couple of years ago, uh, Rising Dispatches from the New American Shore, which was a Pulitzer Prize finalist by Elizabeth Rush. And this uh, is her investigation or her story. She goes around to all of the around the country to various coastal areas, Maine, Rhode Island, Miami, uh, uh, Oregon, uh, the Bay Area, and talks with people who are experiencing firsthand the rising seas and the impacts of climate change. So many times when we think about climate change, it's a rather abstract thing, right? Or it's a rather sciencey thing, or it's a, oh, this will happen in the future. But what she does a beautiful job, and it's just, it's very poetically written as well, is she's showing these stories that are happening right now, right in our time. And the impacts uh, that then touch on not just the science, but environmental justice and uh, the politics of all of this, uh, but by telling people's stories, which is just always a wonderful way to do it. So I highly recommend that one. And What's then the title again? Uh, it's called Rising Dispatches Rising. from the New American Shore. And then this other one, uh, the poet Mary Oliver has written a lot of nature poems over the years. And she did a collection a few years back called Upstream, which was a collection of essays. And they are just, uh, you're nodding, Kateri, have you read this or have you read some of these essays? Um, I've read all of her poetry, but I weirdly have not read her essays. Oh my goodness, you've got to check this out. It (laughs) is, uh, so it's mostly nature essays and many of them just taking place around Provincetown where she lives uh, up near Cape Cod. So again, not where people typically think of as wilderness uh, but she just has such a beautiful way of writing that just brings you in. She also then has a couple of essays on uh, Emerson and w- Wordsworth. And um, uh, so she's, you know, and, and uh, uh, Poe. Uh, so she's looking at some of these figures who are also kind of tied into their landscape in various degrees. Uh, but they're two of my favorites in this book. She has one story about a spider that's mm-hmm. living in a doorway in this house that they're about to leave and just what she shows shares with that one you know story that something most of us walk by every day right but her study of this spider's life and the way she writes it is so powerful and then uh there's a story about a goal that she finds an injured goal and uh brings it in and basically nurses it uh but it's it I'm not going to spoil the ending, but to say that I was basically just ruined by the end of that essay. I mean, because it was so beautifully done and she just makes you care about, again, uh, uh, we see goals all the time, right? Uh, Seagull, no pun, Uh, but we (laughs) we, we see goals all the time and just kind of walk by there. They're kind of like trash birds, right? Or they're birds that don't seem to have much purpose, but she just brings this thing to life and it is just simply beautiful. So I highly, highly recommend that one. It's just a, a great way to, to just read something a little different and, and, and uh, you know, in a lyrical way. 
I'll probably be stopping at my favorite bookstore later. <laughs> yeah. See, if, if you, if you came out, if you came out to go fishing, I would lend it to you. <laughs> 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 well, Hattie, I really, really appreciate this work that you're doing. And uh, we'll of course post all of your information on the, the show notes here. So people can check you out. But please keep up the good work and, and keep loving the outdoors the way you do and celebrating the outdoors you the way you do and bringing more people to the outdoors the way you do. Thank you. I really appreciate it. It's nice to, to chat with y'all. And it's been so fun getting to know Kateri a little bit and having her come and chat with our residents a couple weeks ago. And um, it's been fun to have a little slice of insight into the publishing industry. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Thank you.